With a loud scream, on the night of the 14th of December, 1861, Queen Victoria gave first vent to her grief. Her lifetime of mourning for her husband, Albert the Prince Consort, had begun. That night, the Prince Consort died from typhoid. Queen Victoria was my great-great-grandmother. There's no doubt that the death of Prince Albert led to a period of great uncertainty for the monarchy and the country. The Queen shut herself away with her family and household at Osborne on the Isle of Wight or at Balmoral. She came to Windsor solely to visit the mausoleum here at Frogmore and spent hours praying at this great shrine she'd built for her husband. The Queen had become a recluse, immersing herself in grief. The Queen was black for the rest of her life. Her court had to dress in half mourning. Even estate workers at Balmoral dressed in black kilts. Shops in London ran out of black material. Railings all over the country were painted black and have remained so ever since. A whole industry grew up supporting the cult of death. The Queen shut herself up at Osborne and refused to go to Windsor or Buckingham Palace to be near the seat of government. With Albert gone, she couldn't cope and said she feared she was becoming unhinged. One morning at Osborne, she was heard shouting in desperation by an open window. I will! I will do my duty! She struggled to do her duty. Privy Council meetings at Osborne were strange affairs. First, ministers had to travel down from London to the Isle of Wight. Following this letter, we most humbly submit that Your Majesty will, by your order in Council, authorise the transmitting of a draft of a royal charter for erecting the British settlement in the Bay of Honduras into a colony, to be called the Colony of British Honduras. Approved. We beg leave, most humbly. Approved. Queen Victoria's grief was terrible. She plunged the country into seemingly endless mourning. Buckingham Palace was empty for two years and was eventually boarded up. Some wags put a notice on the railings which said, these commanding premises to be let or sold in consequence of the late occupants declining business. The Queen was no longer doing what her public expected of her. They were baffled and then angry. Her ministers had very strong views. But the Queen's main concern was a national memorial for her late husband. Her cause in the sceptical House of Commons was given a boost by an ambitious politician Benjamin Disraeli, who argued, The memorial should represent the character of the prince himself, in the harmony of its proportions, in the beauty of its ornament, and in its enduring nature, so that those who come after us may say, this was the type and testimony to a sublime life and a transcendent career. All this was music to the queen's ears. Later, after Disraeli carried the vote through Parliament, he was invited, along with other ministers, to the wedding of the Queen's eldest son, Bertie, the Prince of Wales, to Princess Alexandra of Denmark at Windsor. The Queen in black watched ghost-like high up from a gallery. After the ceremony, there was the obligatory photograph with the bust of Prince Albert. At the end of 1864, an event at Osborne lifted the Queen from her misery. One morning, she saw on the terrace John Brown, Prince Albert's favourite gilly from Balmoral. The Queen had asked that he be brought south to help her take up horse riding again. That day, Queen Victoria appeared happy. Brown was suddenly always at the Queen's side. She refused to go anywhere without him. She felt safe with him and gave him the title the Queen's Highland Servant, answerable only to herself. But Brown, the swarthy Highlander, became known as the master of the court and the shadow behind the throne. Brown's manner with his sovereign did appear to be rather brusque. What are you doing with that old dress on you again for? 
Nigh on green with mold for lack of care, I'm thinking. That's enough. John Brown was strongly disapproved of by the court for his overfamiliarity with the sovereign, but he gave her the reassurance and protection she appeared to need. His influence was the first step in her rehabilitation as dutiful sovereign. When the mayor of Portsmouth arrived at Osborne with a request to the Queen, he was surprised by the way her answer was delivered. The Queen says certainly not yet to go. My request was for the Queen. Do not waste the Queen's time, she's busy. But nothing Brown did seemed to alter the Queen's affection for him. First, she raised his salary from £120 a year to 150 and then he was paid £310 and finally £400. The cruel title of Mrs Brown reflected the discontent now being felt within the country. At least the Queen in her seclusion was aware she was unpopular. When the ruling Liberal Party failed to pass the second reform bill, a measure that would have put a million new householders, mainly the middle classes, onto the electoral register, the Queen knew that the discontent amounted to republicanism. When an incoming Conservative government promised to try to enact the new reform bill, the Queen decided she should open the new parliamentary session. It was the first time in nearly six years she'd been seen at a state occasion. The battle for the second reform bill won great prestige for Disraeli, who successfully steered it through the Commons for the Conservative Party. Queen Victoria gave her assent to the new act in August 1867, and here's her signature on the Royal Commission. At a stroke, it doubled the number of people entitled to vote. Although the Queen wasn't aware of it at the time, the passing of this bill would help to shift power into the hands of the electorate. The Queen's troubles did not go away. Fenians, who are Irish Republicans based in America, were involved in terrorist incidents up and down the country. Ireland, which was still part of the United Kingdom, was the key issue for William Gladstone, the leader of the opposition Liberal Party. His long-term plan was Irish self-government, an idea that horrified the Queen. Then the government predicted that Fenians were secretly planning to kidnap the Queen from Osborne. Make sure you cover all the woods all the way down to the main gate. They begged her to go to the safety of Windsor Castle. The Queen refused, believing that it was only a ploy to ease her back into affairs of state. Instead, she allowed police to be posted in the grounds of the park, provided that Brown could organize them. When the plot turned out to be a hoax, the Queen felt triumphantly beaten. With some relief, the Queen was able to ask Disraeli to become Prime Minister when the present Conservative leader became ill. She was overwhelmed by his exotic appearance when he was sworn in at Osborne. He is full of poetry, romance and chivalry. When he knelt down to kiss my hand, which he took... There began an extraordinary relationship between Sovereign and Prime Minister. Disraeli needed the support of the Queen in his duel with the opposition leader, his great rival, William Gladstone. So Disraeli set out to flatter and charm the grieving widow. As long as we are advised of your proposals, you see, we need to know. He hopes that in the great affairs of state, Your Majesty will deign not to withhold from him the benefit of Your Majesty's guidance. <laughs> Disraeli was also a popular novelist, and he made sure the Queen was provided with graphic inside details and all the gossip from Parliament. But the idyll came to an end. The Queen was informed that Disraeli had been defeated in the House by Gladstone and was offering to resign. In desperation, she implored him to carry on until the new electoral register was ready, but Disraeli lost the ensuing general election. The monarch's traditional power to have a say in the choice of government was over forever. The Queen had locked out to the will of the newly enlarged electorate. As Disraeli gracefully bowed himself out of the Queen's presence, Gladstone, his great rival, marched in. Their styles couldn't have differed more. William Gladstone was a popularist. His power rested with his party machine fed by the new electorate. Mom, the primary mission of my government would be to pacify Ireland. If I may read out, Mom, my proposed new cabinet. Lord Chancellor. 
Gladstone had been advised by his wife to pet the Queen. Instead, he read her lists, made speeches, and treated her like a rubber stamp. Lord Chancellor, Mum, Lord Hathaway, Lord President of the Council, Earl Grey Ripon, Lord Privy Seal, Mr. Austin, She reacted predictably and went into retirement again and began writing and illustrating a book about her life in the Highlands in which Brown should strongly. Now, as a direct result of the Queen's continuing seclusion, a much more determined Republican movement was growing in the country. The Marseillaise was sung in Trafalgar Square to celebrate a new French Republic, and a pamphlet was published entitled What Does She Do With It?, asking how the Queen used the money voted to her by Parliament. There was a family conspiracy to try to get the Queen back to duty. Princess Victoria, her eldest daughter, organized a secret round robin to be signed by seven of her brothers and sisters in the following terms. Are startled at the murmurs of discontent which reach us. Those of us who live at home are the unwilling and grieving witnesses of criticism which are agonizing to us to hear. The dangers which are daily spreading will crush the monarchy and the dynasty. But the letter was never delivered. Perhaps they were too frightened. In 1871, for reasons beyond her control, Queen Victoria suddenly found herself back in favor with the public. The Prince of Wales had fallen ill with typhoid. The Queen rushed to his bedside at his home in Sandringham. Fear gripped the nation because the 14th of December was approaching, which would have been 10 years of the day since Prince Albert had died of typhoid. Hidden behind a screen so that her son wouldn't see her, the Queen wrote fearfully. December 10th, 1871. The feeling shown by the whole nation is quite marvellous and most touching and striking. <laughs> and on December the 13th... This really has been the worst day of all, and coming so close to the sad 14th filled us and I believe the whole country with anxious forebodings. Finally, on December the 14th... This dreadful anniversary, the 10th, returned again. Instead, it brought the cheering news that dear Bertie had slept quietly at intervals, the respiration much easier. The whole country breathed a sigh of relief. On the way to St Paul's for a Thanksgiving service, the show of affection amazed the Queen. Dressed in black and wearing only a simple bonnet, she drove in an open carriage to enable the people to see her properly. Then, two days later, another near tragedy touched the Queen, as she was alighting from her carriage outside Buckingham Palace. Brown had got down to let down the steps, when suddenly someone appeared at my side. Then I perceived that it was someone unknown, with an uplifted hand. Involuntarily, in a terrible fright, I threw myself over Lady Jane Churchill. I soon recovered myself to stand up, and I saw Brown holding a young man tightly, who was struggling. They thought the man had dropped something. Look, there it is. I then did see shining on the ground a small pistol. This filled us with horror. It is to good Brown and to his wonderful presence of mind that I greatly owe my safety, for he alone saw the boy rush round. Queen's life. She was severely shaken, but her prestige in the country rocketed. In the space of a few weeks, republicanism was dead the royalty problem had been swept away. The faithful John Brown was awarded the Victoria Devoted Service Medal. He's the only recipient of that honor in history. We have a large conservative majority change of ministry will take place shortly. Mr. Gladstone has contrived to alienate and frighten the country. It was February 1874 and Disraeli had won the general election for the Conservatives. At his swearing-in, the Queen treated him like a long-lost friend. 
13 years after the death of the Prince Consort, she was no longer in deep despair. I saw Mr. Disraeli at quarter to three today. He knelt down and kissed hands, saying, I pledge my troth to the kindness of his princess. Whatever the sovereign wishes should be done. The Queen's wishes were symbolic. With Disraeli now at her side, she needed to fulfill her great destiny and that of the British people. We had the largest fleet in the world, a professional army, and vast colonies that were the envy of Europe. Now that the parliamentary parties had finally tempered the British crown's power, her destiny lay in foreign affairs, the empire. The Israeli too could see sound reasons for patriotism. The Conservative Party would become the party of empire. The empire needed an empress, and the Queen asked Israeli's government to make her empress of India, the brightest jewel in the imperial crown. To mark the occasion, the Queen sent the Prince of Wales out to India to preside over the celebrations given in her honor. The Prince became the incarnation of the British Raj and was treated everywhere like a god. Missions for the poor were opened and charity was dispensed in his wake. He was even given a pair of elephants that later appeared at Sandingham. My thoughts much taken up with the great event at Delhi today where I am being proclaimed Empress of India. I have for the first time today signed myself as V.R. and I. That day, the 1st of January, 1877, she wrote New Year cards. One went to Disraeli, bearing her initials VRI, Victoria Regina et Imperatrix. From his best friend, VRI. At about this time, the Queen also gave Brown a locket containing some of her hair and some belonging to the Prince Consort. Emblazoned in enormous jewels, Queen Victoria gave a dinner that night here in Windsor Castle the night she became Empress of India. Disraeli made a florid speech praising the Queen. And when the loyal toast was proposed, he called out, Your Imperial Majesty. Whereupon, to everyone's amazement, the Empress rose and did a half curtsy to her Prime Minister. Later, the Queen had the Durbar Room added at Osborne House. It looks like an Indian temple, but its architecture is rather surprising, sitting in the middle of the Isle of Wight. The Queen was mesmerized by India. The corridor next to the Durba Room is lined with portraits of her Indian subjects. As well as Maharajas in their magnificent costumes, she commissioned pictures of ordinary people. Here we see soldiers, a potter at the age of 102, a carpet weaver, silk spinner, coppersmith, servants, farmers and children. They represent the close affection that Queen Victoria held for the people of her subcontinent. The Queen took her role as mother of the empire seriously. A chieftain from the Gold Coast visited and asked whether he could take back one of her mourning bonnets to Africa as a ceremonial crown. Almighty oh, Queen, give me alone the right to wear it and this pass to my successors. The Queen was happy to oblige. Disraeli's foreign policy echoed the Sovereign's grand vision. Received a box from Mr. Disraeli with the very important news that the government had purchased the Viceroy of Egypt's shares in the Suez Canal for four million pounds, which gives us complete security for India. It is entirely Mr. Disraeli's doing. It is just settled. You have it, madam. The French government has been outgeneralized. Next day, Disraeli, with a theatrical flourish, presented the Queen with the share certificates. The Suez Canal coup was entirely the doing of Mr. Disraeli, who has very lofty views of the position the country should hold. His mind is so much greater, larger, so much quicker than that of Mr. Gladstone. And Disraeli was asked to sit the first Prime Minister to do so at a Queen's audience since Lord Melbourne 40 years before. The Queen at 60 was working harder than she'd ever worked in her life. 
She was immensely popular with her people and her armies, and they approved of her vision of imperial power. The Israeli may have given her the impression she'd achieved a permanent position overseeing the empire, but Gladstone had other ideas. Preparing for the fast approaching general election in 1880, Gladstone was making a series of electrifying speeches in his Midlothian constituency and elsewhere. He attacked the colonial wars which had done so much for the prestige of the Queen and the country. Pleading for the rights of the savage, he denounced the title of Empress of India as theatrical bombast and folly. By appealing directly to the nation in this way, the Queen believed that Gladstone was usurping her role. But when the Liberal Party won the election, the Queen was faced with the alarming prospect of Gladstone as Prime Minister again. She will sooner abdicate than send for that half-mad firebrand. Others but herself may submit to his democratic rule, but not the Queen. There must be no attempt to change the foreign policy, no change in India, and no hasty retreat from Afghanistan. With Gladstone in power again, the Queen became less interested in affairs of state. When she was spending time at Balmoral, she often preferred to stay here at the Glasselt, her house on Loch Mick, some miles away from the castle. At times, this house was literally at the hub of the empire. Its modest rooms and simple furniture really rather humble for the Empress of India. Then came a series of tragic blows. First, her close friend Disraeli died in April 1881. Such a loss is irreparable to me and the country. To lose such a pillar of strength at such a time is dreadful. Then John Brown had to carry the Queen back into the castle after a fall at Windsor in March 1883. And less than two weeks later, the dreadful news that my good, faithful Bran had passed away early this morning. It is the loss not only of a servant, but of a real friend. The shock, the blow, the blank, the constant missing at every turn of the one strong, powerful arm and head almost stunned me, and I am truly overwhelmed. And now all is gone. All is gone in this world, and all seems unhinged again in thousands of ways. Such was the status of Jossies, empresses even. He may have been only a simple gilly without education, but he was the only person in the household who could make the Queen do what she didn't want. When Prince Albert died, a statue of him was placed on the Balmoral estate. It faces the one of Queen Victoria. Remarkably enough, just about here, where I'm standing, the Queen put another one up to John Brown when he died. And so the three memorials together formed a triangle. His statue was removed from the triangle by King Edward VII when his mother died and tucked away here in the woods. The Queen of 65 was lonely but still resolute. Foreign policy remained her obsession and here she felt Gladstone was at his most neglectful. When General Gordon was under siege from hostile troops in the Sudan, she begged Gladstone to send out a rescue column to Khartoum. The Queen trembles for General Gordon's safety. If anything befalls him, the result will be awful. Six weeks later, the Queen was still questioning Gladstone's policies. Mr. Gladstone, you told the Queen when we last met Gordon must be supported. Yet what he asked for repeatedly nearly five weeks ago has been refused. If not for humanity's sake, for the honor of the government and the nation. When Gordon was murdered nearly a year later, just before the relief column finally arrived, the country was in uproar. Now from Osborne, the Queen sent a telegram to Gladstone. It was deliberately uncoded for all the world to read, saying, to think that all this might have been prevented and many precious lives saved by earlier action is too frightful. It is I who have as the head of the nation to bear the humiliation. The Gordon Day Buck was responsible for bringing down the Gladstone government. 
But in six months, Gladstone was back, and it was the issue of Irish self-government, the Home Rule Bill, that did most to divide the country and also Gladstone from the sovereign. To Queen Victoria, Home Rule was a threat to her empire. Ignoring her true constitutional role, the Queen set out in 1886 to disrupt Home Rule by secretly working with a Conservative opposition leader, Lord Salisbury. She was letting him see Gladstone's confidential cabinet papers to the Queen about the bill's progress. May 8th, the Queen sends Lord Salisbury a copy of Mr Gladstone's letter to her. There was a very important cabinet meeting to decide whether any concessions were to be made in the bill. If they were made, they would certainly be defeated. This is the first avowal of defeat. Please return the enclosed. The second letter I received last night, which she would also ask to have back. The Queen was at Balmoral when the final vote on home rule was taken. But division within Gladstone's own party was making the bill's progress increasingly unlikely. I did not sleep well as I felt worried and anxious. When I got up, a telegram was brought to me which gave the news that the government had been defeated by a majority of 30. I cannot help feeling relieved and think it is the best for the interests of the country. More than 30 years earlier, in the halcyon summer days at Osborne, the royal children gave a regular afternoon tea party in the Swiss cottage for their parents, the Queen and Prince Albert. Here, in the children's own playhouse, the Prince Consort conceived a grandiose scheme for his family. His plan was to marry the family into royal houses on the continent. His aim was to achieve peace and influence in Europe. And here you can see demonstrated the Prince Consort's greatest vision. This famous photograph was taken when Queen Victoria went to Coburg to attend a family wedding over 30 years later in 1894. There are cousins from Russia, here's the Tsar, Germany, the Kaiser, Romania, as well as connections with Spain and with Greece and Denmark, my great-grandfather, King Edward VII to be. All these people are related to Queen Victoria, but closer analysis of the picture shows how the dream was about to shatter. First to be married was Princess Victoria, Vicky, Prince Albert's eldest and favorite daughter. At 17, she married Prince Frederick of Prussia. The Prince Consort hoped that through this marriage, the belligerent Prussian ascendancy would be tempered by a liberal constitutional monarchy. Instead, the worst happened, and the couple produced a son, Kaiser William, sitting here with the waxed moustaches. He was the Queen's German grandson, and it was he who led his armies against Britain in the First World War. Please advise me how to say, uh, we would like to send a letter to the Viceroy. Can Viceroy go? Can Viceroy go? Ek cut. Ek cut. Cut, Your Majesty. Cut. The Sovereign began to learn Hindustanis, who she could deal with Indian affairs of state. Suddenly, another strange figure came into the Queen's life. And how to send a telegram to the Viceroy? Abdul Karim now took the place of John Brown. Abdul Karim, known as the Munshi or teacher, was disliked by the court as much as Brown. In early 1894, the Queen's old adversary Gladstone finally came to hand in his resignation. He was 85, 10 years older than the Queen. Both had such poor eyesight they could scarcely see each other. And although Gladstone had served the Queen as her Prime Minister a record four times, at his final audience, the Queen uttered not a word of thanks. She had much difficulty in finding topics for an adequate prolongation. But fog and rain and her coming journey to Italy all did their duty and helped. She was at the highest point of her cheerfulness. A miserable day outside again today, Mr. Gladstone. My journey to Italy shortly should be very good for my health and for the sake of the country. Gladstone's great power had come with the birth of the nation's first modern party democracy. 
it had made the two of them needless rivals for the country's affection. With Gladstone's passing, the Queen was at last prepared to assume a role of prestige and influence rather than power, a pattern followed by sovereigns ever since. In June 1897, the 60th anniversary of the Queen's accession, the might of the British Empire was on parade in London, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. Here, the Queen had no need to exert her power over difficult politicians. As mother of the Empire, her influence was there for all to see, and she was clearly moved by the occasion. A never-to-be-forgotten day. No one ever, I believe, has met with such an ovation as was given me passing through those six miles of streets. The crowd was quite indescribable, and their enthusiasm truly marvellous and deeply touching. Every face seemed to be filled with real joy. I was much moved and gratified. Surrounded by a mounted escort of various members of her family from all over the world, Queen Victoria arrived in her carriage at St Paul's Cathedral. She was too arthritic to go up the steps, so a special service was held outside with the Queen sitting here in her carriage at the bottom. That day, for the first time, the Queen used Telegraph to send her jubilee message around the Empire. From my heart, I thank my beloved people. May God bless them. Eighty years old, her eyesight failing, the Queen still had one more service to perform. With the outbreak of the Boer War in 1899 in South Africa, she found a new lease of life, rallying the nation. After a string of defeats, stirring memos were dispatched to her government and to her commanders. I sincerely hope that the increased taxation necessary to meet the expenses of the war will not fall upon the working classes. The attempted relief of Ladysmith would have succeeded had we had more troops. Red tapings and useless difficulties must not be regarded. Would not a corrugated iron huts be used instead of tents? It is quite imperative that Lord Roberts should not move until he has plenty of troops. Pray impress this on him. Please let me know what steps you intend to take to protect the Zulus from being attacked by the Boers. We are bound in honour to stand by my native subject. The Queen dispatched 100,000 tins of chocolate to the men at the front, which promptly melted in the African sun. A period in December 1899 became known as Black Week after three major defeats of the British Army. At Windsor, the Queen rose to the occasion, telling the Foreign Secretary, Please understand there is no one depressed in this house. We are not interested in the possibilities of defeat. They do not exist. But Black Week coincided with the anniversary of the death of Prince Albert and privately the Queen showed her real feelings when she visited the mausoleum at Frogmore. Already 38 years since the dreadful catastrophe which crushed and changed my life and deprived me of my guardian angel. I feel very low and anxious about the war. By Christmas 1900, the Queen was not well. She was sleeping badly, eating nothing. On Christmas Eve, she came down to the Durba room at Osborne to see the distribution of presents, but could only write. I felt very melancholy because I see so badly. I gave all my personal servants their usual presents. I took a little supper in my room. On January the 13th, 1901, the Queen's Journal, the diary she had written for 69 years, finally came to an end with... Oh, just going with me rested afterwards, then did some signing. The Queen was taken ill, and she slowly began to sink. From all over the country and from Europe, members of her family began to assemble at Osborne House. The Queen lingered on for 10 days, and finally, on the 22nd of January, 1901, learning that the end was near, they began 
gathering at her bedside. Sir James Reed, the Queen's doctor at her deathbed, later wrote, All the family were summoned, and the Bishop of Winchester said prayers for the dying, while I kept plying her with oxygen. The princesses Christian, Louise and Beatrice kept mentioning each other's names, the Queen for long, too blind to see. Dear Mama, it's Beatrice. Luncheon is close too. It's luncheon. You're not alone. It's Bertie. <laughs> the Kaiser remained the whole time on the opposite side to me. The Queen kept looking at me and frequently gasped. Sir James, I am very ill. A few minutes before she died, her eyes turned fixedly to the right and gazed on the picture of Christ in the entombment of Christ over the fireplace. She died with my arm round her. I gently removed it, let her down on the pillow and kissed her hand. When she died at 6.30, I had for the last hour been kneeling at the right side, supporting her in a semi-upright position, helped by the Kaiser who knelt on the opposite side of the bed. The Queen wanted a white funeral. A picture of her was painted at Osborne, looking serene in her final sleep, dressed in white. The death of Queen Victoria marked the end of one of the greatest eras in the history of this country. But there was one final twist. She'd left a secret list of keepsakes that she wanted placed in her coffin. Some were from Albert and looked from everyone. Sir James called in uh, members of the family to see her. And Princess Alexandra was the last, and, and she arranged white flowers over her, so she looked uh, beautiful. And then they all left, and he put a photograph of John Brown in her left hand, as per her instructions, and a lock of his hair, which he wrapped up in tissue paper. And then he covered her up with the white flowers which Queen Alexandra had put there, and then he called in the rest of the members of the household to come. Do you think that, that Queen Victoria's children were aware of some of the things that she'd been asked to have placed in her coffin? No, on, only her maids and dresses and Sir James, who did the arranging himself. Here they were for the first time, these instructions. They'd only been seen by Sir James and those few dresses. On a cold winter's day, Queen Victoria was finally buried in the Frogmore Mausoleum. In death, she was at last reunited with the Prince Consort, the man she'd always been so devoted to. The solitary statue of Prince Albert on his tomb was joined by one of the Queen, her head half turned towards him. The Queen's statue had been carved years earlier when the Prince died, so that she would always remain in the likeness of a young woman. Inscribed above the door of the mausoleum, in Latin, are these words by Queen Victoria. Farewell, best beloved. Here, at last, I shall rest with thee. With thee in Christ I shall rise again.